Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this uh, Sabbath day, a day when we can take a break from our work and our toil and fellowship together and hear your word. And Father, um, as I give this presentation, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross as I am not worthy to even utter these words, uh, but I pray that your will would be done and that your people would be blessed by the reading of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you want to take your Bibles, if you want to take your Bibles out, to, uh, we're going to turn to Psalms, Psalms chapter 77. Psalm 77 and verse 13. Psalm 77 and verse 13. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? So the Bible tells us here that uh, God's way is in the sanctuary. And so right now, if we had uh, our video up right now, I'd be showing you an image of the sanctuary right here. <laughs> okay? And... Uh, Here's another image of the sanctuary. This is the sanctuary in the wilderness. And uh, in the sanctuary every day, there was a work that was done. Hey, this, maybe this is a new technique here. There was a, there was a work that was done uh, by the priests and the Levites on, on a daily basis. And uh, one of the important things that they did was um, the uh, remission of sins. And that's when the sinner uh, would come into the courtyard and uh, the priest would uh, officiate over the sacrifice of the lamb. And then uh, as he would... Uh, uh, take a little bit of the blood of the sacrifice. He would then go into the first compartment of the sanctuary and he would come to this uh, altar right here. Does anybody know what this altar is called? Altar of incense. And uh, he would sprinkle a little blood on that. And what would that do? What happens when you, you know, uh, those of us who formerly grilled out on a barbecue and you get a little of the juice from the steak on the charcoal, what does it do? It smokes, right? And so that smoke ascending was our prayers going up to heaven. Now, as we uh, talk about the sacrifice, we're going to go back before uh, the Jews were doing it in the wilderness. And can anybody tell me what this story is right here? Do you see this picture? Well, that's actually Abraham. Remember Abraham and Isaac. And remember the story where uh, Abraham was going to offer his own son, but then what happened? God provided. And so here in, in, uh, in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 8, it says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. You know, that almost makes me cry when I hear that. Because, listen to these words. God will provide himself a lamb. So it's not just that God is going to provide this lamb right then and there. It's that he's going to provide himself a lamb. So this goes back to the garden. So we think about these uh, sacrifices and this uh, sacrificial system that's going on here. How's that? Uh, but what's going on here is that it predates even Abraham. It goes all the way back to the garden. This is where uh, Adam and Eve are 
in the garden. They eat the forbidden fruit. And then what happens here? They realize they're naked. They, they realize that they have sinned. And what happens here? God explains to them that their sins come with a price. That the penalty for sin is death, but he's going to provide a substitute. So what does he provide here? A lamb. And what does he unfortunately have to do with the lamb? The Bible says in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8. So according to the Bible, the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. So that Lamb that was slain, and what did, what did God do with that slain Lamb? What is this? He's making a covering. The covering is going to cover their nakedness. He's going to take away their sins. In Romans chapter 11, verse 27, he says this, For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. And so, had, uh, was there any death ever in the world up until this point? Did, uh, had Adam and Eve ever eaten meat before? The Bible says in the uh, Genesis story that uh, uh, the, the fruit of the trees, that would be meat for them, right? So this was a really hard thing for them to do. They had been given the dominion over these animals, and now what were they going to have to do? And the Lord explained to them that every time they sinned, what were they going to have to do? They were going to have to do this again. The Bible says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And so this story of the lamb goes all the way back to the very beginning because the lamb is talking about Christ who was slain from the foundation of the earth. So at the very moment that they partook of the forbidden fruit, that lamb would have to be slain, who's Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if you can see this very well, but what this is, is a little chart here, because in the Jewish uh, year, it was broken up into holidays. So you had holidays in the spring, and you had holidays in the fall, right? And so that's what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to talk about uh, their fulfillment, okay? So in the spring holidays, the first holiday is the Passover. Then the unleavened bread then the first fruits, and 50 days after the first fruits is Pentecost. Now, we call it Pentecost, but in the Old Testament, it was known as the Feast of, Feast of Weeks. And what happened was, it was also where they would have the wave loaf offering. And so they were commanded to make two loaves, okay? So what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to go ahead and just make a diagram here. Um, so you have the first one is what? Passover. And then the next one is what? Forgive me if I spell wrong. Uh, and then the next one is what? And then what happens down here?
Uh, is it an A or an O? Okay. So Pentecost means what? 50, right? Like if we have a pentagram, how many sides does it have? Five sides, right? So here's what happens in this story right here. Uh, go with me to the book of, uh, of Exodus, Exodus chapter 12. And we're going to look at verse 1. So on the night that they're going to leave Egypt, it's this day, right? Let's read it. Verse 12, uh, chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year. So what happens is the month that they're leaving Egypt is going to be the first month of the year. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 3, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. So they're going to, everybody that's going to, uh, in the future, they're going to take this lamb. And let's read on about the lamb. In verse 4, it says, And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. And this is why. Because the commandment is that they're going to kill this lamb and they're going to eat the flesh of it and there can be no flesh left over to the morning. And so if there's only a couple of you in the household, do you think you could polish off a lamb in one night? No. Probably not. So you need to get as many as it's going to take to be able to get that accomplished. Verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or the goats, or from the goats, and ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So they were to take this lamb in the first month, on the tenth day of the month, and what were they to do? No, no, no. They're going to, do the, they're going to, keep, they're going to kill it on the fourteenth, but on the tenth day, what are they going to do? They're going to bring it into their house. Okay? So how many days is it going to take for the children and the family to take a, a shining to this lamb? You're going to develop this uh, relationship with this lamb, aren't you? It's going to be in your house. I mean, there's not too many things cuter than a lamb, right? And they're very affectionate. And then just at the point, and it's got to be without spot and blemish, and then just at the point where you've grown attached to the lamb, you've got to kill it. Verse 7. It says, And they shall take the blood and strike it on the side, on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. And so, I might even have a picture of that in here. I actually have the quotes in here. There you go. Look at that. And so this, can everybody see this? So this right here is pointing, even though this is a prophecy way back in Egypt, we're going, to, we're going to put the door right here. And uh, they were to 
put the blood here on each side of the door. And, um, and what's this pointing to? It's like a reflection, you know? Christ is the lamb, and his blood is going to make the angel of death, what? Pass over us, right? <clears throat> now, according to the Bible, in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, the Bible says this. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So according to Scripture, God doesn't what? Change. change. He doesn't change. And Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8 says this, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. I want to talk to you about this for a second. <clears throat> When the Jews came out of Egypt, God was restoring the law unto them, friends. If God doesn't change, then that means the same system that he gave to the Jews in the wilderness was the same system that he had set up all along. Now, according to the Bible in Genesis chapter 3, if you want to turn there, excuse me, Genesis chapter 4, and verse 3, Genesis chapter 4, and verse three, four, 3, excuse me, Genesis 4, 3, okay? It says here, and I have this fancy little picture with it. It says, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. So notice this. The Bible is saying, in the process of time. In other words, there was a specific time when Cain and Abel came to the Lord and brought their offering. Now, the Bible tells us that the Lord doesn't change. He's the same today, yesterday. I change not. And so, when was it that this event would have been happening? Friends, listen. If you're to have a lamb here on the Passover and the Lord doesn't change, and He commanded them to bring a lamb, and it was at a specific time, and in, Gen in, in Exodus chapter 12, it says, at this time, you are to do this, it's got to be the same time. Okay? Same day. Same day. In fact... Let's move on. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 4. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. Now we had just read, here's, another, here's a little picture here. We had just read a few minutes ago that Cain brought what for an offering? First fruits, okay? But the scriptures make it very clear that on this day, at the appointed time, what do you bring? A lamb. A lamb. But Cain is bringing first fruits, okay? <laughs> Verse 5. But unto Cain and his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And what happened? We'll see here in a second. Cain killed his brother. Isn't this a fascinating that the very first murder that ever took place was over worship? And friends, Isaiah talks about the Lord revealing the end from the beginning. I have a picture right here that was commissioned many years ago. And, uh, and if you notice right here, there's the cross. And when was it that Christ was crucified? What day was it? 
It was the Passover, right? And notice right here the history of the, the priest, Cain and Abel, and Adam and Eve. There you go. And according to this picture, Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, and the first sacrifice had to be made to cover their sins. Cain and Abel, Cain killed Abel, his brother, and the sanctuary service to kill the lamb on the Passover and the day that Christ was crucified and the Lord's Supper were all on the same day. But what happens here at this point in history, Cain, knowing that he's supposed to bring a lamb, brings something else. Now let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Was it per... per did you have permission to bring anything else? Well, let's find out. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 6. Can everybody see this? The Bible says, And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days must you eat unleavened bread. So here is the next day. So according to Scripture, this is the what day? 14th. And this is the 15th. How many days would you eat it? So from this point right here on, seven days. I think this one's darker. There we go. Leviticus 23, 7, moving on. It says, In the first day ye shall have a holy convocation. Ye shall do, do no servile work therein. So, you know what, a, what, when the Bible tells you not to do servile work, you know what that's called? A Sabbath. See, Sabbaths don't, aren't just on the seventh day. They're on whatever day they happen to fall in that year. Because these days, 14, 15, 16, and onwards, are not dictated by, by the seven-day cycle. Did you know that? These, these time periods were dictated by what are called new moons, okay? New moons. And so the new moon is also known as a, as a dark moon. It's when, uh, it's when the moon is basically completely gone. There might be a little sliver here, but they're just completely almost gone. You can just see this little, little sliver right here. And, uh, and this happens on the first day on the first day of the month, okay? So when you're looking in Scripture for the first day of the month, it has not to do with the seven-day cycle. It has to do with when the moon came in, the new moon. And then at the end of 15 days, what happens? which I think is pretty interesting. It's a full moon. Did you know that? It's a full moon. And then at the, at another 15 days past that, making 30 days, you have a new moon again. So, so a month is 30 days. This is important. We'll get to that later. Verse, verse 8. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work. And you know why I said, uh, why, why I talked about this during no servile work? <clears throat> because when you have a Sabbath, which is the unleavened bread was a Sabbath, it says no work on this day. So... 
on this day right here, no work. Now, occasionally what would happen is that the lunar Sabbath and the seventh day Sabbath would line up. And what would that be called? A high holy day. Right? So, so it, it, in the year that Christ was crucified, this is what happened. You had the seventh day Sabbath and the lunar Sabbath completely lined up on the seventh day in that particular year. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Verse 9, And Moses, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, this is uh, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10 now. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And so this first fruit right here on, on this day, what, what day of the month is this now? The 16th. And so, what would happen on this day? And what does he have in his hand? The first fruit. And how do we know it's barley? Because that's the first thing that comes up. And remember, it's springtime, right? You know what? When do you sow barley? In the fall. And so as soon as the ground starts getting warm, it springs up, and it's the first thing that comes available. Okay? Now, let's talk about Cain again. What is Cain bringing? He's bringing the first fruits. Look at this. This is unleavened bread, right? This was on what day? It was on the Sabbath. And it was a high Sabbath. Right? Friends, do you think that, it, that, that this was a coincidence or do you think God had this plan from the foundation of the earth? Don't kid yourself. Right? Friends, listen. If this is the seventh day... What's, what was this day? Wow, you're telling me this was Sunday? Friends, who was the first? Turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel, the seventh chapter. We're going to talk just for a second here about the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. And the Bible says this, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and do what? Think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time's time and dividing of time. Friends, we can look at these powers, whether it be the Antichrist power illustrated here in Daniel chapter 7, or whether it be about the king in the northern tribes. What was his name? He made an altar and he set up a day on the Sunday. Do you guys know this? Who was the king of the southern kingdom? And the king of the northern kingdom. Jeroboam. Read that story. Jeroboam changes the day of worship. Okay? Why? Because he doesn't want people going to Jerusalem. He sets up an altar in Samaria, even though the commandment says to go where? Jerusalem, right? So he changes the place and the day. Friends, the Antichrist power going all the way back to Cain is to change the day. 
And this is what Cain tries to do. It's not that there isn't a day to bring the first fruits. It's that he brought the first fruits on the wrong day. He was putting his day above what? God's day. <laughs> Go with me back to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 4. I'm diverting a little bit here, but I think there's a very interesting thing here. So this man that changes the day of worship, God ordains a specific day. He changes the day. He changes the offering. And what does he do? When those are doing what God says, he wants to what? Kill them. Verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Friends, not only does Cain change the day, he receives what? A mark. And the Bible tells us that the seal of God is the Sabbath. But at the end of the world, there's something called the mark of what? The beast. We'll talk about that later. Very interesting. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 11. And ye shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priests shall wave it. So let's talk about this for a second here. Christ is crucified on the Passover literally the same day, right? Then the next day, Sabbath, we understand is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the third day is the first fruits or the wave sheaf offering. Now, I want, can everybody see this? Everybody see this okay? What do you see? You see the tomb and the rock, right? Then what's on the other side of it? Unleavened bread. Okay? Representing this day right here. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to sort of alter this a little bit. <clears throat> and on this day right here, what were, what were they to be eating? Unleavened this unleavened bread. And what is this representing here? The tomb. Do you know why? Because it's unleavened. You see, leavening is a symbol of death. It's a symbol of decay. And the prophecy was that his body would see no what? No decay. No corruption. And so... When Christ goes into the tomb, he's not going to be there long enough to be decayed, right? And so this unleavened bread that many, many, many years before was commanded the children of Israel to eat on that specific day would represent him being in the tomb. Amen? And I, we like to say as Sabbath keepers that he even rested in the tomb on the seventh day. Can I get an amen? And listen, friends, I don't know how you could see this any other way. If Jesus had told to them another day, can you think of an, another person more than Mary Magdalene who loved Christ? Can you think of anybody? John, maybe, yes. Okay? But here she believes that he's the Messiah. He dies. She would not even violate the Sabbath day to prepare his body. Isn't that true? Put, they put him in the tomb, and they came back on the first day of the week. She let him rest, and she rested on this day. On the Sabbath day. There's just, it's incredible. So what happens next? Can you guys see this? So this is that day after. The third day. What is this a representation of? The first fruits. The first day of the week. What does the scripture say? 
1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The stone is rolled away, and the Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Can I get an amen on that one? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 23 says, 1 Corinthians 15, 23, But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. And friends, we're going to get an opportunity to be among those fruits as well. All those that die in Jesus will be resurrected out of the grave and they will be first fruits as well. But in order, Christ was the first fruits of them that come from the grave. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says not one jot or tittle will in any wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. And what you're looking at here, friends, is the type and antitype or antitypical fulfillment of each one of the days and their meaning. The first day Passover, that's when he would be crucified. That's when his blood would take away our sins, causing that curse, the curse of death, to pass over us. The unleavened bread representing his commitment to rest in the grave and his promise that his body wouldn't see corruption and his resurrection on the third day or the 16th day of the first month giving us hope that we can be resurrected along with him. It's very beautiful, isn't it? Now... What happens here? 50 days later. 50 days later. What happened originally 50 days later? What were they given? Because we're, we're going all the way back to the beginning here. They came out of Egypt. The first fruits, 50 days later, they were taken to the base of Mount Sinai, and what did God give to them? The law of God, the Ten Commandments. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 15 says, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. That's this day. Right? Can I get an amen? On the morrow after the Sabbath, from that day... Ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall ye complete. What's seven times se seven? Forty-nine, right? So that equals how many days when you include this day? Fifty days. Verse 16, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, ye shall number fifty days, and ye shall make an offer of new meat offering unto the Lord. Verse 17, Leviticus 23, 17. Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two-tenth deals. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. So friends, here, we're to, they were to have the unleavened bread, and here, they're to do what? They're going to make, I'm going to just... Uh, Let's see, draw this loaf of bread here. I know this is uh, sort of modern bread or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and here's an image of uh, some fine Jewish bread here. All right. And it was to be fine flour. 
and there were to be two loaves. Why were there to be two loaves? How many, lo how many stacks of unleavened bread were in the sanctuary? Two, two right? And so the Bible says, man shall not live by bread alone, but what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And God gave them on that day those two tablets of stone. And so as they're going through this ceremony every year, they're to remember what happened here. And what happened here? They entered into a covenant with the Lord to keep His commandments. The sacraments, they entered into a covenant. Yes, he spoke, he spoke the law to them before he wrote it, and they entered into a covenant. So what you have here is an, a picture here. And so this right here was the Jews celebrating this wave offering of the loaves. Okay? And then after Jesus went back to heaven, what happened? You had the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples. Yes. And so, on this same day, on this same day, I'm going to just do a stick man here now. They had the Holy Spirit descended on them and cloven tongues of fire, right? Let's see what the Bible says about that. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 15. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 15. The Bible says, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So friends, God gave the Ten Commandments here, right? But here He writes them where? in their heart and in their mind. And because he does that, he enters into what? A new covenant. Because at this covenant right here, when they were in the wilderness, there had to be the shedding of blood. But Christ had shed that blood. So according to the scripture here, there's no more offering or sacrifice. It's all been taken care of. And now we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the law of God is written in, in our mind. Amen? And listen, friends, every one of these events is fulfilled on what? The exact same day. The self-same day. Yes. All on the same day. Everything is fulfilled exactly as foretold. Now, that begs the question. Back to our chart here. We just went through the spring festivals and holidays. These are the spring ones. But remember, there are spring and there are fall. Amen? How many of them are there total? How many are here? Well, let's go ahead and line them up. We'll put a line under them. So this is one. This is another one. This is another one. And this is another one. But there's three more yet to go in the fall. Right? And according to scriptures, there's three more. The Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. 
So listen, friends, let me ask you a question. If the Lord doesn't change, and He's always fulfilled every one of these events, because you have type and anatype, right? He's not going to give us a symbol of something and do it in a totally different time period, right? If Jesus said not one jot or tittle would in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled, what about the rest of the holidays? Don't they have to be fulfilled too? Let's get into these autumn festivals. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 24. The Bible says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall have a what? A Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of the trumpets, a holy and holy convocation. What we're going to do here is talk about the importance of blowing trumpets. It was commanded by Moses from God that the Israelites make two trumpets of silver, and they were to be made in one piece. And they were to blow them for two, or well, actually more than two, but for mainly two reasons. When they were to pack up and move on, and when they were to have a holy convocation, and also if an enemy was approaching, they were to blow the trumpets, okay? Turn with me to the book of Joel. And we're going to find out here how important it is about the blowing of the trumpets. Joel chapter 2. By the way, you know this Joel, uh, book of Joel and all the Bible prophets are for us at the end of the world. Did you know that? Because the Bible says that everything that happened aforetime is an example for us at the end of the world. Okay? So in Joel chapter 2, it's, and we're going to start in, uh, in verse 12. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rent your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is a gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Verse 14, Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Verse 15. Chapter? Joel chapter 2. Joel? Yes. Joel. Job. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just getting to the, the this, we're getting to the crescendo, so you haven't missed much. Joel chapter 2 and verse 15. The Bible says in verse 15, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom groom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? So here is this verse right here about blowing the trumpet. Why is it such a solemn event? At the beginning of our presentation today, we talked about the sanctuary. I'm going to draw this over here. And uh, this is the outer courtyard. 
This is the sanctuary itself. This is the holy. And this is the most holy. And out here was the brazen altar, the laver. And so the priest had a daily service where he would take the blood into the holy place and place it here on the altar of incense. But once a year, on the Day of Atonement, in the autumn, he would enter into the most holy place one time. Now, in this yearly cycle here, if you had not had your sins forgiven, you were forever cut off from the people. And friends, if you were cut off, that also means you were eternally lost. Because on that day of atonement, when the priest would come out, he would cleanse the sins of the whole people in that one day. And when he would come out, he would make a pronouncement. And if you hadn't got your sins into this place before he made that pronouncement, it was too late. And this happened in the autumn. The Lord's merciful, friends, because He gave the children of Israel an announcement by the blowing of trumpets that that day was coming. Right? Because, I don't know about you, but if I had to go and confess my sins by this one particular day, it may be necessary for me to take a little time to figure them all out and get them in there. Especially if I had wronged somebody and I needed to go to that person and make things right. Right? So that I could get my sins forgiven. The priest did the work. Our job was to just confess. But we had to make this confession. And so every year, on the first day of the seventh month, that trumpet would be blown to call this event, that it was coming at hand, this Day of Atonement. <clears throat> So I have here an image, and notice this. I've got Christ in here as the high priest. Because see, on this earthly sanctuary service, the high priest went into the most holy place one day a year. But notice in this picture, I have Christ. Why? Well, let's just talk about this for a second. Let's go back to the time of Christ here. So, all these things were fulfilled in the ministry of Christ and His disciples. Amen? And then, before Pentecost, Christ went where? Back to heaven. Right? Isn't that true? He went back to heaven before... Pentecost, and he told the disciples that he was going to send the Comforter, right? Now, if all these prophecies in Scripture are about Christ, and Christ is no longer on the earth, then where do the rest of the events have to take place? In heaven. In heaven. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 27. The Bible says this, Also, on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be an atonement, a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So, on this particular series of events right here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a line across here. So we don't get confused. So this represents, I'm just going to put it over here. 
This is the spring, okay? And below the line, hopefully you guys can see this, is the fall, okay? So these have been fulfilled. These events have all been fulfilled. But if Christ went back to heaven and not one jot or tittle would in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled, then these fall ones must take place not in this time period and not in this place. Does that make sense? I also have, if we would have had my PowerPoint up, I would have shown you this, a little bit more of a detail than what I just did on the board right there. But notice this, the courtyard, it says, represents the earthly part of his ministry. Okay? So let's prove this. Uh, this right here is the, uh, the, uh, where the sacrifice would take place, the brazen altar, right? Now, there was a door opening right here, and uh, the sinner would come in through this way, right? But we're told that Christ nev never what? He never sinned. So which direction did he come from? He came from this way, right? Amen? But he, he came and met us where we are, right? Now, at the beginning of Christ's ministry, what did he do? He got baptized. So this is a representation right here. This is the laver where the priest, the high priest would wash. And so what he does is he doesn't have to confess his sins before baptism because he never sinned. So he gets baptized as a symbol for us, right? And then what does he do? People don't talk about this too much. But did you know in the courtyard there was something over here? It was a table. And you know what the table was for? Well, believe it or not, there's been tricksters for a long time. Not just now. And the commandment was that, uh, that when you bring your, your lamb, that it has to be without spot or blemish. So what they would do is they, the, uh, the sinner would come over here before he could uh, give his offering and uh, the priest would put the lamb up on the table and inspect the lamb to make sure there was nothing wrong with it. There was no spot or blemish, right? And then the sinner would walk over here place his hands on the lamb, slit the animal's throat, and then he was done, right? The lamb is the one that bore the brunt of the sin, okay? And all this took place in the world. So here's what happens. Jesus comes into the world. He begins his ministry. He's baptized. He goes to the examination table. And listen, friends, I want to I add something here. Turn with me in your Bibles back to the book of Genesis. I think that this is one of the most profound things in all the scriptures. The book of Genesis. And uh, Genesis chapter 3. And verse 17. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. And the Bible says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And thorns and also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Verse 19 and in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt, re and unto dust thou shalt thou return. So here's the deal, here, friends. The symbol of sin, the curse of sin, was thorns and thistles. Can I get an amen? And so. 
Christ, just before he gets to the examination table, they place a crown of what on his head? Of thorns. So he's actually bearing the curse. The symbol of curse is upon him. And you know when he takes his step up onto the examination table? He goes before the whole Jewish nation. And the leader of the nation, Pontius Pilate, examines him. Oh, he's the leader, all right, because he's Rome's representative. You see, the Jews couldn't pronounce any judgment on them because they had given up their authority. In 158 B.C., they had entered into the League of Rome, and the Bible says what? To whom you yield your servants to obey, they become your master. And so now the Romans are the master, and Pontius Pilate examines Christ, and he says, I find what? No fault with him. This takes place here. Then he goes to the next stage, like a lamb to the slaughter, to take away our sins. And then he goes back to heaven. But there are these fall feast days. Hebrews chapter 4, turn with me there. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. How are we doing with time? Uh, it takes a little longer when you can't use the PowerPoints. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Friends, listen, this is proof positive. We're not speculating here. This is proof positive. Hebrews chapter 4. I'll wait for you guys to get there. It's important if you have your Bibles to see this with your own eyes. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Friends, he's gone into heaven. This is what the Bible says. But he's not gone to heaven not to do anything. He's our great high priest. Can I get an amen? amen. Verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Friends, listen. We have this high priest, and he's been tempted in all points as we are, but without sin. And I have to say this, I think he's been tempted more. I think he's been tempted more. And the reason is, he, he, was in, he, he, had to, he laid aside divinity, took upon himself humanity, and listen, when you have the power to create worlds by the sound of your word, and people are nailing you to the cross, and they're scourging you, and they're doing all these things, what kind of a temptation it would it be to call a legion of heavenly angels and just wipe out human existence? Have we ever had that kind of temptation? I think not. <laughs> Amen. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1. The Bible says... Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. This is what we've been talking about. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is also called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Verse 4 which had a golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the Testament, which is what it, what's in the holiest of all. God's law, friends. In the very center of the holiest of holies is God's law. And what's at the center of the law? The Sabbath. God's title, the Creator. Verse 5, And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Verse 6, Now 
when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. How many times? Always, every day, they went into this first compartment right here. But what does verse 7 say? But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Do you understand what that means? We couldn't understand God's plan because remember the psalmist said we, at the very first quote, thy way, O Lord, is what? In the sanctuary. His plan of salvation, the plan of redemption is told in the story of the sanctuary. But as long as the first tabernacle was there, we couldn't fully understand the plan of salvation. You see, people were going along, killing these animals, and they became habitual. Oh, can you imagine the millions of people by the time that Christ comes, and they had crates and crates and crates of animals stacked high, and you know, there wasn't enough lambs without spot or blemish, and they're taking paint, and they're painting over the blemishes and stuff, and the priests are entering into these side deals, taking money and bribes and all these things, and selling these animals. And they didn't want that thing to go away because the whole Jewish economy depended on the slaughtering of animals. People couldn't see past that. But look what it says in verse 9. Verse 9 says, Which was a figure for the time then present. That was just a figure in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of what? Reformation. Friends, listen. Those that did these ceremonial things to receive remission of sins were ultimately still forgiven by Christ that would do His work yet in the future. Because these things can't take away sin. They were pointing to this right here. Verse 11. Hebrews 9, verse 11. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Friends, here it is, right here. This is, this is not a fiction that we're talking about. This is the real thing. By a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Friends, he is our high priest. He is gone into heaven for us, and he is doing the service of the high priest for us even right now. But we're going to talk about here how it is that these fall festivals are fulfilled. How is it? So let's back up for a second. Number one, we know that these events took place in the courtyard. Amen? That's been established. The Bible tells us proof positive. The Bible then goes on to say that Jesus went back to heaven and that he's officiating as our high priest in heaven. So now the question becomes, how, when, why, and where is the fulfillment of these things that take place? So, the first thing that we're going to deal with here is the trumpets. The trumpets, right? Because that happens when? On the first day of the seventh month. Okay? 
And then what happens? I think I spelt that wrong. There's an E in atonement, right? And that's the what? The tenth day of seventh month. And then what's after that? And that is on what day? It's on the 15th day You guys got that okay? Okay. So the question we have to ask is if everything was fulfilled to the very letter and on the exact same day, when would it be that Christ, because the Bible, we just read it, that he, had, he went into the first compartment of the heavenly sanctuary and he's daily ministering on our behalf, but this has been going on for what, 2,000 years? Almost 2,000 years? At what point would he enter into the final phase of his work? Because if everything has to be fulfilled to the very letter, we need a place in the Bible that tells us when Christ is going to go from the holy to the most holy. And that day is called the Day of Atonement. It's when the sanctuary is cleansed. So is there a place in the Bible that tells us when the sanctuary would be cleansed? And praise God there is. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. Here it is. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And friends, by the way, while you're looking this up, I want to tell you this. None of these prophecies can be dealing with an earthly sanctuary because, friends, Jesus predicted in Matthew chapter 24 that the earthly sanctuary would be destroyed and there would be no, well, not one stone left upon another. And since 70 AD, there hasn't been an earthly sanctuary. But the book of Hebrews tells us there's a better one in heaven. And Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14 gives us the answer of when the sanctuary would be cleansed. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, and the angel is talking to Daniel, and, and this is what he's saying. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be what? Amen. Cleansed. <clears throat> Do you know the Bible tells us that some of Scripture is good for interpretation? Oh. All Scripture. So if we're looking for a cleansing of the sanctuary... Now, did you know that this actually tells us the exact time when the sanctuary would be cleansed? Amen. The problem is we need a starting date, okay? And we need to find out, are these 2,300 literal days? Well, there's two ways to look at this. There's two ways to look at this. It's dealing with the sanctuary, okay? So when it says unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. It's in the context of dealing with sanctuary cleansings. And we know that it has to be for many days because check this out. Look at verse 15, 16, and 17. The Bible says this, And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. 
And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. And so the vision is talking about what? Well, it is, but it's also talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Amen? Now, was it going to be 2,300 days from the time that he gave this vision? Look at verse 17. Because the man who is, I believe, Jesus Christ, is telling Gabriel, make this man understand. And verse 17 says this, So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. So what happens is, at the end of time, is when this vision is going to be accomplished. Sometime after the end of time. At the end of time. Okay? So we know from history that Daniel lived 2,500 years ago. Okay? Over 2,500 years ago. So the situation is this. We have two ways to look at this. Number one, we need a starting point. And number two, are they 2,300 days or are they 2,300 days of atonement? They're 2,300 days of atonement because you would enter into the sanctuary once a year, right? So if there's one day a year you enter into the sanctuary, then it would be 2,300 what? Years because there's only one day of atonement. And if you turn with me, to Book of Numbers. You guys should know this. Where are we going? Book of Numbers, chapter 14. And all scripture is good for what? In verse 34, Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34, the Bible says, After the number of days which ye searched the land, even forty days each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. We're going to prove in a few minutes that this 2,300 days actually is 2,300 years. And if you want a second witness for this day for a year principle, go to the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6. Ezekiel 4, 6. The Bible says, And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Now, we need the starting point, right? We need the starting point for the 2300 days. Friends, if we can find out when the 2300 days ends, we can identify when the trumpet was blown to warn for that day. Can I get an amen on that? Okay. Let's go to the starting point. Remember, God sends Gabriel to make Daniel understand the vision. And so this is what the angel tells Daniel. Daniel 9 and verse 24. Daniel 9 and verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the what? There it is. That's the whole thing we're talking about here and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the Most Holy. Now, here is where the date comes. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah shall be seventy weeks and threescore what? Praise the Lord. 
So what we're going to do here, I'm running out of whiteboard. What we're going to do, yeah, I might have to use this one. What we're going to do here is we're going to figure this out. We're going to do this. It shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall even in what? Troublous, Troublous times. All right, so I'm going to have to resort to a new board because we don't want to erase this yet, okay? Let me, get, let me see if I can make this stand up here. Look at that, like a glove, okay? So we have a starting point right here that is being told to us. And we know that this is connected with the vision. So the starting point of the vision and the starting point of this prophecy has to be one of the same, okay? So let's look at the clues here. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. There it is. There's the date. So let's hold your finger in this little place right here. And we're going to go to the book of Ezra. Okay. Ezra chapter 7. And... Uh, we're going to look at a story right here in Ezra chapter 7. And um, we're going to pick up the story what was the command to do? Restore and rebuild. Okay. In Ezra chapter 7 verse 11 let's check this out. Now, let me give you a little bit of a background here. Ezra, uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's in the uh, exile, and, um, and the king here is named Artaxerxes, and he's going to give him a commission, and let's read what it says here. Verse 11. Now, this is the copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even the scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and of his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of God of heaven, perfect peace at such a time. I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will, to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee, for as much as they are sent of the king and of the, his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of thy God, which is in thy hand. Verse 15, And to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem, and all the silver and gold that thou canst find in all the province of Babylon, with the free will offering of the, the people and the priests, offering willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem, that thou mayest buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs, and their meat offerings and their drink offerings and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever shall seem good to thee and to thy brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold that do after the will of your God, the vessels also. And let's jump down. Uh, he's going to tell him, and let's pick it up in verse 21. And I, even I, Artaxerxes, the king, do make a decree that all the treasurers which are beyond the river, that whosoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, shall require of you, it shall be done speedily. Okay? So, verse 23. Whosoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven for why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? So what happens here is this. Here's the decree 
by Artaxerxes. He's saying, take all this gold, silver, manpower, buy animals, all this kind of stuff, and go back and rebuild, right? To rebuild Jerusalem. Now, we have the event, but all now we need is the time. Praise the Lord, he gives it to us. Let's look at verse 7. Back up a little bit. And there went up some of the children of Israel and the priests and the Levites and the singers and the porters and the, I can never pronounce that word, Nephilims, Nims, Nephilims, thank you, unto Jerusalem in the what year? In the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. Okay, stop. Barry, borrow that from Jerry Franklin. Stop. Um, now, we have here the date. And you're saying that's no date. Actually, it is a date. It's the seventh year of the king. Now, friends, listen. There is a, a document. It's called the Canon of Ptolemy. Canon of Ptolemy. You can write that down. You can research it out. In fact, you can even go online and look at it. And this document is uh, thousands of years old. And it's a, uh, um, it's a record of all the kings in antiquity. Egyptian kings, Babylonian kings, Persian kings. And it gives the dates uh, when they came onto the throne. Okay? And here's the thing. Um, if we reject that document for those dates, then we basically have to reject all the dates in antiquity. In fact, when we're reading the history book and we're saying, you know, Nebuchadnezzar lived between this year and this year, and, and Herod, you know, the king lived between this year and this year, and Augustus Caesar lived between this year and this year, and all this kind of stuff, well, this is where this stuff comes from. And so if we reject this information from the canon of Ptolemy, we have to reject uh, virtually all of ancient history, okay? Now, uh, the canon of Ptolemy tells us when the first year of King Artaxerxes was. And then all you have to do is count seven years. That's very easy. You can do it on two hands. Okay? So according to the canon of Ptolemy, this event happened in the year 457 B.C. Do you know what that means? We have our starting point. Because the Bible says, from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that's when we start. And that event, according to history, was the year 457 B.C. And, um, and the scriptures even tells us... Uh, Check this out. We read verse 7. Now let's look at verse 8. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. There it's repeated again. Okay? But notice this in verse 9. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. So that's pretty detailed, right? So according to, according to uh, the, the scriptures, um, Ezra leaves Babylon on the first day of what? On the first day of the first month, right? And then how long does it take him to get to Jerusalem? It takes, it takes four months. It takes four months because 
he, re he arrives on the first day of the fifth month. Okay? Now, did they start rebuilding Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month? No. no. Now, how do we know that? We're not going to take the time to do it. But when, when Ezra arrives at Jerusalem, and by the way, Ezra is given unbelievable power by the king. <laughs> In fact, he's given power over life and death. Okay? Because he's the king. And by the way, if you read the book of Daniel, you'll see that these kings were like some of the most powerful people ever lived. Remember, if you walk into the room and you haven't even been asked, what happens to you? You're done. So, you know, whatever the king said, you're either alive or you're dead, right? That's, that's pure power. And so the king bequeaths this power to who? Ezra. And Ezra's got all these people with him and this gold and everything. And here are the people in Jerusalem. And you know what they had done? Well, they had, uh, they, the priests, they were told not to intermarry with, uh, with uh, the, the heathen. And, when, and, and what were they doing? They were intermarrying with them. And so when, when Ezra gets to Jerusalem, what does he find? Can he start building the house of the Lord when the priests are intermarrying? And they're having these children with heathen women and everything. And what are the children doing? They're bowing down to idols, right? And so what happens is there necessitates uh, some work, okay? And uh, when they find out the authority that Ezra has, they come to him and are they crying? They're afraid. They're afraid. And so what happens is they've got to go through a day of atonement and, the, and they've got to have a cleansing of the whole nation of Israel. And then the work can begin. Okay? So this happens when? In the seventh month. Okay? So this process begins in the first day of the first month, but the bu building of the sanctuary can't commence until there's been an atonement in the seventh month, and then we can move forward. Okay? So, this is when we begin our 20... What's that? A text for the seventh month? We already went over the text for the seventh month. And yeah, it's in, uh, it's in Exodus. Okay, so this begins our 2300 year prophecy. Okay? So we, ha we know that the prophecy has to be years, and here's why. Because according to what we read in Daniel, chapter 8, the angel Gabriel tells Daniel that it's for the end of days, but it starts here at the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, right? So it couldn't be 2,300 literal days because that would have ended way, 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 way long time ago, okay? But the prophecy is for the end of time. So if we want to know where the 2,300 days ends, then we all only have to do a mathematical equation. Okay? So let's look at it like this. So we take 2,300 and we minus 457. And what does that equal? 1843. Is that correct? Well, remember, you have to account for the fact that Ezra doesn't arrive in Jerusalem until the fifth month, right? So you, even with that little tidbit of information, you couldn't begin at the beginning of the year, right? So you have to go 2,300 complete years 
and that would necessitate going into the following year. Is everybody following me? Okay. Let, let, me, help, let me help this out, okay? If, uh, if I told you that uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have enough gas for the generator to burn for one year, nonstop, and I started uh, running the generator in the seventh month, at the end of that year, which would just be five months away, uh, the generator would still be running and it would go into the next year, right? And so we can't start at 457 at the beginning of the year. We have to go seven months into 457, which would take us past the year 1843, seven months into 1844, which would mean that the 2300 years would end in the 10th day, 7th month of 1800. And 44 AD. Okay? Does that make sense? And since it has to do with the prophecy of the cleansing of the sanctuary, and we know it can't be the sanctuary on earth because that's done, the prophecy is about when is the sanctuary going to be cleansed, and that means the only sanctuary is in heaven, and that's the only place where there's a high priest. So the question is, when will the sanctuary be cleansed? Well, the answer, 2,300 years from the going forth of the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, shall the sanctuary be cleansed? Now let me ask you a question. How many years would that mean that Jesus was in the first compartment of the sanctuary? Follow with me again. Let me take this down a second. So we know that Christ was crucified around 2,000 years ago, right? And then 40 days after he walked the earth, he went back to heaven. That means before the day of Pentecost, according to the Bible, he went into the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to intercede as our high priest. So how many years was he in there if the sanctuary wouldn't be cleansed until 1844. Over 1800 years. Yes. So let me ask you a question. If Jesus did his daily ministration on our behalf, hearing our sins and forgiving them, you know, with his own blood in the heavenly sanctuary, if he was in there for almost 2,000 years, would he simply pop in to the most holy place for 24 hours and come out? Or would there be some kind of equation that he would be in there until an appointed time? Are you following what I'm saying? So, what happens here is this. 2,300 years brings us to the 10th month and the seventh day of the month of the year 1844. Now the question is, yeah, tenth, day is tenth day, no, I'm right, tenth day of seventh month, okay? I'm sorry. It's the tenth day of the seventh month. Now here's my question. When's the tenth day of the seventh month? This is really important, guys, because if this is true, it has to be on the exact day. Because remember the prophecies? Everything has to be on the exact day, right? So in order for this prophecy to be true, something had to have happened on the tenth day of the seventh month 
of the year 1844 A.D., which is already passed, by the way. And so how do we get to the 10th day of the 7th month? What is the 10th day of the 7th month? And how's the math that we get to do this? <laughs> are you guys yes you're you're getting there but there's a, a little equation are you guys are you, are you guys enjoying this at all okay remember we talked about these new moons Okay, here they are, right here. Okay? Now, math is kind of amazing because if you can find the first day of the first month, then you can find the tenth day of the seventh month. Does that make sense? Right? Okay. So, let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. You know, 25, 30 years ago, as a young Bible student, I have to confess something. I used to get irritated with a certain part of Scripture. I was like, Lord, you're so redundant. <laughs> Forgive me. Everywhere in the Old Testament, the Lord kept saying this. Remember how I brought you out of Egypt. Has anybody else ever seen this? It's like everywhere you turn. Remember how I brought you out of Egypt. Remember how I brought you out of Egypt. And it's like, okay, but it's just all the time. Why do you think the Lord would say, remember that? I don't know that there's any other saying in Scripture where we're being reminded as much as this one. Rem remember how I brought you out of Egypt with a strong hand. Remember how I delivered you from bondage in Egypt. Remember how I did this. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 12, verse 2. This shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So the first month of the year is when the Passover takes place. And so now what we have to do is a little investigation here to find out what time of year it was. Because see, the Bible, when Jesus talks, he says, you look at the seasons, right? Isn't that what he says? He says, how do you know what time of year it is? This is in Matthew chapter 24. When you look at the buds on the trees, you know that what's coming? Summer, right? Friends, this is how the Bible tells time, okay? By the seasons. You know, in the, in the, in the spring, it's the early rain. In the fall, it's the latter rain. So, turn with me to Exodus chapter 9. Remember when the Jews were in Egypt, there was a series of events. They were called the plagues. There was ten plagues. There was ten plagues in all. The first three plagues fell out on both the Egyptians and the uh, Hebrews, okay, which, you know, is kind of happening now, okay? Because things are happening again here at the end of the world. And the seven last plagues fell out only on the Egyptians, right? And so in Revelation, only those that have the mark of the beast at the end of the world are going to receive the seven last plagues. Now, in uh, Exodus chapter 9, there's a story here about what's going on. In verse 29, let's pick it up. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know how that the, the earth is the Lord's. So Moses is going to end the hail here. Look at verse 30. 
And as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye will not yet fear the Lord. Verse 31. And the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax was bold. But, verse 32, but the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. Now let's go back to our board here for a minute. And uh, what do you have on this day right here? Okay, and what do you have here? What, what is this made from? Yeah, but what is it made from? Wheat. Okay, so when you're back here at this time of year, what's coming up? What does this priest have to have on this day? The barley, that's the first fruit. That's the first thing that comes up. The wheat won't be ready for another 40 or 50 days. Okay? So what happens here in this story, it says the flax and the barley were smitten. Why? Well, let's talk about this for a second. When barley and wheat and various grains come into their time, when they're young, they're very flexible. Isn't that kind of true in real life too? The younger you are, the more flexible you are. And the older and more mature you get, the stiffer and easy to break you are. Amen. Okay? So what happens is, as this hail is coming down, what's happening? Well, the barley is mature. And so as it's hitting the barley, what's happening to the little barley? They're breaking off and they're following and they're being destroyed, right? But the little wheat, what's happening to them? You're just getting all beat up, but I'm good. Hey, it's good. It's all good, right? So this is telling us right here, it says, but the wheat and the rye were not smitten, for they were not grown up. They were growing, but they weren't grown up. They weren't mature. They weren't at that point where they were brittle. Because, you know, when the wheat is mature, you can just take it and cut it, and you can just beat it against something, and the little wheat berries just fall off with not much effort, right? Friends, this is telling us what time of year it is, okay? This is telling us what time of year it is. And according to historians, okay, that visited the Middle East during this period in the 1840s, the only month of the year that barley was seen to be growing in its maturity was the month of April. Why is this important? Because you can't have a first fruits without the first fruits. And if the eyewitnesses, see they don't grow barley in Israel anymore. In fact, Jerusalem is like a metropolitan area. So there's no fields of barley there anymore. Okay? There may be a few soldiers and stragglers here and there, that come up naturally, but there's no fields of barley anymore. So we have to rely on historians to tell us when the barley comes in. And the historian tell us that it's the month of April. And so April would then be the first month, but it would be what event would have to happen in the month of April for us to know the first day of the month? Nope, the new moon. So the first day of the first month, which is April, in the year of 1844, because that's what we're trying to determine here, the 2300 day prophecy, because we know that it's on the 10th day of the seventh month, we gotta, we gotta figure out when the first month is first to know when the seventh month is. So, according to the U.S. Naval Observatory. Have you ever heard it? How many people have ever heard that before? U.S. Naval Observatory, that's the official timekeeper of the United States government. It's located in Washington, D.C., and the Vice President of the United States, his house is on the grounds of the U.S. Naval Observatory, right across the street from the uh, Vatican Embassy, by the way. And, um, and check this out. This is no joke. This is no joke, listen. 
I I'm going to draw a little map right here. So there's a street corner here, and uh, and there's a gate right here, and that gate goes into the Naval Observatory, okay? And the Naval Observatory is up in here. It's like a dome. It has a telescope and all this stuff. But in here is what's known as uh, You guys ever heard of this before? The atomic clock. I don't know how accurate it is, but it's like it's supposed to be accurate to within a fraction of a second every 10 million years or something like that, okay? Uh, so this clock right here looks like a giant uh, nightstand clock that you would have. You know, like red LED, uh, red digital clock. And it's bigger than this, you know, this uh, board right here and it tells the exact time and all clocks in America are set by this atomic clock butt right here and this street right here is called um, Massachusetts Avenue correct can I get a second witness so this is uh, this is Mass Avenue that's what we call it I'm from DC and so here's the clock right here this is the clock and right here is the Vatican Embassy. And I think this is a hoot, quite frankly, because these are the people that change time, and there's where the time is kept. Isn't it interesting? Anyway. So, uh, so here's what we're going to do. According to the U.S. Naval Observatory right across the street from the Vatican Embassy, which is where the Pope stays, by the way, when he's in town. Uh, and also uh, NASA has a website where you can look this up. Um, the, the, the first full day, now I have to tell you this. See, this does become a little bit of a mind bender. Because according to the Bible, the day doesn't begin at midnight. It begins at even right from even to even and so every biblical day straddles two of our days so this makes it a little bit complex okay but historians and if you have a problem with this I'm not going to go into all the details but the first full day of the first day of the first month in the year 1844 was the 19th of April Okay? April 19th, 1844 was the first day of the first month. But you're like, how can we say January 1st is the first day of the first month? Because remember the mark, remember the beast power, remember the Antichrist power in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. One of the signs of his being the Antichrist is the fact that he would do what? Change times and laws. Okay? And so he's done that. In fact, the calendar that we used is called the Gregorian calendar, named after Pope Gregory. Okay? So, according to the U.S. Naval Observatory, the, and I'm going off a of memory now, okay? All this is based on what place and time? Jerusalem. Okay? According to the U.S. Naval Observatory, the first day of the seventh month came in in Jerusalem at, I believe it was 1124 on October 9, 1844. Excuse me, October 11th. Now, here's the thing. Jerusalem time is ahead of us by three hours. So on our time, the first day of the first month, the seventh month, would have been on the 12th of October, 1844. One day. Not, not a day. It was because 
the, the, the new moon came in at like 1124, okay? But he, it doesn't really make any difference because according to scripture, you don't begin the day until the following evening. So a new moon comes in, but the day can't begin until even, okay? So that means that the first day of the seventh month was on the 12th of October, 1844, when this happened right here, the blowing of the trumpets. So now we ask the question, on the 12th day of October, 1844, was there a warning given that the Day of Atonement was coming 10 days later? Because remember, the Day of Atonement is the 10th day of the seventh month, right? 10th day of the seventh month, which would have placed this at October 22, 1844, when Christ would enter into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and begin the Day of Atonement, the anatypical Day of Atonement, or the final aspect of his work in the heavenly sanctuary, is there, is there an event that took place on this date, yes or no? The answer is yes. It was called the Great Advent Movement. And the word that Jesus would enter into the most holy place, or the word that the Day of Atonement would begin on October 22, 1844, went around the world, every mission station on earth, proclaimed by the Advent and these Adventists were made up of Presbyterians and Baptists, Lutherans and Episcopalians and Congregationalists. They all came together, studied the time prophecies, and they trumpeted to the whole world that in just a few days, the judgment would begin, and they called it the Judgment Hour Message. And do you know what else took place on this day right here? The Lord raised up a people that would not keep nine of his commandments, but all ten of his commandments, and they would start sharing the very message that I'm sharing with you right now. And before this day, they were called Adventists. But after this day, they started being called Seventh-day Adventists. Because an Adventist is somebody that's looking for the coming of Jesus Christ. And Seventh-day Adventist is somebody that has the seal of the living God, which is the Sabbath. And so, on October 22, 1844, our great high priest, Jesus Christ, entered into his final work. And remember, just as in all these prophecies here, all these events were fulfilled to the very day. The very day. Now, I was going to go over with you, but for time's sake, we'll have to do this next time, and explain the 70-week part of the prophecy that you were studying, because we're getting way in over time here. Uh, but, but I want to ask you something. So, I want to get a, a verification from everybody. I'm going to take the, the red marker out here, just like the school teacher would do, and I'm going to ask a question in review. So, does everybody agree that Jesus fulfilled the Passover as the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth on the very day, yes or no? Yes. Check. Did Christ fulfill the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, on the exact day uh, representing that his body would not see any corruption and that he would rest even on the Sabbath day, yes or no? Yes. Check. Did Christ come forth from the tomb as the first fruits of those resurrected from the dead, fulfilling and representing the first fruits in the ordinance that was given to Moses, yes or no? Yes. Check. According to the prophecy, was there a group of people? Oh, thank you. Fifty days after the first fruits, after Christ went back to heaven, was the Holy Spirit poured out where God wrote these laws in their hearts and mind 
fulfilling the wave sheaf offering, yes or no? Yes. Was it on the very day? Yes. Check. Remember, not one jot or tittle would in any ways pass from the law until all would be fulfilled. Amen? Now, that concluded the spring. Now let's move to the fall here. 2,300 years, according to Scripture, after the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, was there a people on the first day of the seventh month in the year 1844 that were preaching that this event was getting ready to happen? Yes or no? Check. History tells us so. Have we shown conclusively through Scripture alone that Jesus, our high priest, entered into the last phase of his heavenly work to atone for our sins in the day of atonement, the cleansing of the sins of all time, and he's soon to come out of the most holy place and come back and listen, friends, I want you to think about this. Judgment has to go first. Why? Because when Jesus comes back, according to the scriptures, he brings his reward with him, friends. You have to make a determination who gets the reward before you dole it out. Isn't that true? And this is why it was called the judgment hour. Friends, we're living in the judgment hour right now. Christ, our high priest, is in the most holy place. Have we verified this, yes or no? Yes. Check. That means, friends, there's only one left to be fulfilled. Only one. And friends, I want to ask you this question. I'm not going to answer it. I want you to answer this for me. If every one of these prophecies about Christ was fulfilled at the exact time, is that one going to be fulfilled at the exact time too? And what does this prophecy have to do with? What happens during the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, friends... The Feast of Tabernacles is all about a restoration. Restoring that which was lost. And friends, listen. If all these things happened on the exact same day, friends, I want to ask you this, because I don't want to answer this. Will this event take place when Jesus Christ restores to us that what was lost in the Garden of Eden on the exact day, yes or no? And if you say no, the implication is none of these had to happen on the same day either. And the reason I say this is because all the early Adventists taught, yes, that he was going to come on this day. But guess what? We don't know what year that's going to be. And we don't know the day or the year we know the date, but you see, the way that the Jewish calendar works is that the 15th day of the month this year is going to be from different than next year. It moves all around. And since we don't know the year, we can't know the day. But be assured, he is going to come on the Feast of Tabernacles on the 15th day of the seventh month, and what year and day that is, I have no idea, but it's going to be fulfilled to the very letter. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your holy word and that you have fulfilled everything to the very letter. Not one jot or tittle has in no way failed from the law, and we can know with confidence that you are in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, and that you are making an atonement for our sins. But soon you are to leave and finish your work there. I pray that, like the book of Joel says, let us, let us call a holy convocation. Let the people come and let us confess our sins one to another, that they may be blotted out while there's still time. We thank you, Lord, for these amazing truths. In Jesus' name, amen.